Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you've come out on this very fine September evening for an event featuring Joanne Hart and Genevieve Plunkett talking about their books that deal with so many aspects and angles of survival. Before we get to the event, I wanted to uh, let you know about a few things that Birch Bark is up to. Um, we, as you know, have a literary magazine called Microlit Almanac. And submissions are open until the end of September. We welcome submissions. We uh, limit them, limit the number of sub submissions that we accept. So if you want us to consider your work, I strongly recommend getting it in sooner rather than later. We also run a couple of workshops, one of which is called Kaleidoscope. It is an asynchronous at your own pace. Uh, gathering of uh, writers. If you're interested in that, that's also on our website. And as many of you know, because I see return visitors to our events, um, we are uh, in many regards, uh, we run on energy and your support is always appreciated. So thank you very much for that. Okay, without further ado, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have um, two very prolific authors with us this evening, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome Joanne Hart and Genevieve Plunkett, um, two women that I've known for quite some time and have followed and admired from afar and maybe not so far. Um, allow me to take a moment to read their bios, and after I read their bios, uh, we will start with the readings Genevieve will read first, and it will be followed by Joanne Hart, who is the author of the collection of short fiction, High Wire Act and Other Tales of Survival, which won the 2022 Hudson Prize, publication by Black Lawrence Press this month. Her most recent work is the crime memoir, Stamford 76, a true story of murder, corruption, race, and feminism in the 1970s. Her novels are Float and uh, a comedy about plastics in the ocean and Addled, a social satire. Addled was the Penn New England Discovery Award in fiction and Float was awarded the International Literature Festival, was, was presented at the International Literature Festival in Berlin in 2017. Her short fiction and essays have appeared in a wide range of uh, literary publications. Um, her concern, of course, is humans and the environment, and you will hear more about that in a moment. She lives in Gloucester with her husband and some rescue livestock and, for, livestock. and for more information, please visit her website. Her book can also be purchased at the website that you will see in the chat. Genevieve Plunkett is the author of Prepare Her, stories. Her fiction has appeared in the O. Henry Prize stories and the best small fiction fictions, as well as journals such as New England Review, The Southern Review, Crazy Horse, Colorado Review, and Eclectic Literature. She lives in Vermont with her two children. Her novel, In the Lobby of the Dream Hotel, can be purchased in the link that you will find in the chat. Welcome, Joanne and Genevieve. And Genevieve, we're looking forward to your reading. Thank you, Kat. That was, it's great to see you both. We've been chatting all week on email, so this feels very cozy. I'm going to read a chapter from my novel, In the Lobby of the Dream Hotel. This chapter is called Hunger. I'm really not good at um, summing up the book, but in order to get you into the, the passage that I'm reading, but I think that it's self-explanatory. So I'm just gonna go for it instead of butchering the, um, <laughs> the summary. So this chapter is called Hunger. Ever since Carrie had texted her about Albie Porter's unreleased song, Portia had found herself listening to it on repeat, forgetting to eat breakfast and lunch, nearly forgetting to be at school on time to walk Julian home. She had not noticed that anything was amiss at first because it had felt so good and so promising listening to these songs as if they had been written just for her. How they moved through her body like personal triumph, like the thrill of good news again and again, 
All she had to do was hit repeat, hit repeat. She knew the hills and valleys of Porter's songs, the specific nuances of his voice, where it became gruff or where it soared or where it was unguarded and soft, so familiar to her that she could see the shape of his mouth in her mind. Her senses were so ignited that she could not help but feel as though every particle of the world had been designed specifically for her. The grass and spider webs in the morning trembling with dew the air itself crafted finely to accommodate her body, hugging every eyelash, every goosebump. In this way, she had begun to love the world through its minutia and also its laws, light, darkness, gravity, death. What funny little things, she thought, like Julian with his toys, that's her son. He could not see that they are much less than he imagined them to be, that their eyes were only buttons their downy voices, his own. Portia had played guitar when she was young, before she was married and before her son was born. She had been told in college that she was skilled at writing songs and she wondered sometimes how far she would have made it if she had committed herself, if she had not given up. She could have made it big. She knew this now, hearing Albie Porter's last album, seeing his mouth and the shape of his lyrics in her mind, understanding that he was somehow reaching for her through the lyrics. Did any part of you step back from this? Dr. Shea wanted to know and question what was going on. Portia had been seeing Dr. Shea again. He was nearing retirement and had already begun referring his patients to other doctors. However, he had made an exception for Portia. After all, they had known each other for so long. So part of you deep down knew that it was a delusion. Dr. Shea lowered his voice. In all the years that Portia had known him, he had never used that word. She had not come to him because she suspected that she was delusional. It was only that she had been losing sleep over the matter and it was making her irritable. She had shouted at Julian one morning for scraping his cup along the tabletop. She was not a mother who shouted. Portia looked hard at Dr. Shea. Do you know that you're going bald? She asked him, right on top where you think people can't see. Part of this new sense of daring sometimes meant that she was not afraid to be blunt, even rude. Dr. Shea tilted his head incredulously, but fondly. She could see that he was deflecting the insult by looking at her this way, as if he knew her so well, as if she were a young lover acting unreasonably, and he found it adorable. She had become aloof toward Nathan, that's her husband, during the day and clingy at night. The days were full of things to do and music to listen to. The days filled her with gratification. When the sun shone through the window pane, she could see the specks of dust churning through the wedge of light and it changed and it was endlessly brilliant. At night, however, the activity of the day, the lights and the music disappeared and she was left alone with a cavernous ache inside her chest. She lay in bed and wanted to pull the world into her, to gather it up around her and press it to her. She pushed her face into Nathan's hair and breathed in the dull, oily scent. The desire that she felt for him was like nothing she had ever experienced, like being engulfed in flames, looking desperately for someone to drag into the fire. Her hand found the elastic to his boxers. She tasted his neck, bit him right behind his ear. She wanted something from him, something explosive and annihilating, but he swatted at her. What's wrong with you? He asked. She eventually dreamed that she climbed a mountain and found the castle of God and that the castle of God was so unfathomably large that she required a special kind of goggles to be able to see it. The angels fitted her with the goggles, which looked more like a heavy transparent helmet that magnified the light shining into her head. The result was overwhelming. She experienced the feeling of being very high up and important, having climbed all that way to the highest point in the universe. She could sense the angels dancing around her, all creamy and fair, trailing their bright auras. That was when she realized that what she had been looking at, the immense house of God, this impossibly large building balanced on the peak of everything, was not a castle at all, but only the very first brick of the foundation of something even larger, something that she would never be able to understand. When Portia woke the next morning, things were better. She was hungry again. So she made herself an egg in the frying pan, watched the white skirt of it sizzle and snap in the butter, and she began to feel the pain in her stomach, just under her ribs. 
It felt like the pain of coming back to life. She had heard accounts of people regaining consciousness after having been pronounced dead, how to some it had felt as if they were being dragged back into the world against their will, the agony of their nerves rekindling like a million tiny fires. Hi, Joanne. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Your turn now. <laughs> that was great. I'm good. Um, I'm going to read a um so this is a collection of short fiction. So um you, I it's hard to choose something that uh that sort of reflects the whole book, but um I chose something based on the fact that it fits in it a seven minute reading and it turned out to be like this perfect match for what Genevieve has read. So um, this is called, When You Are Done Being Happy. When you are done being happy, kneel in front of the cabinet at the far end of the kitchen. It is the place you stored all the things you thought you might need someday, but won't. Look behind the tortilla press you bought 20 years ago, right before fresh tortillas became widely available in supermarkets, making it obsolete. Find the kit for baking a checkerboard birthday cake. It remains unopened, even though you often thought of it, but there was never enough time for a project of that magnitude. There was only the rush for a store-bought cake or in a good year, homemade cupcakes with canned frosting. If the children cared, they kept that information to themselves. They are gone, but the checkerboard cake pans are waiting for you. Take them out now. You have the time. When you are done being happy, think back to a list you made when you were 15 years old and so miserable you wanted to fly out of your body. When you made a poorly thought out attempt in that direction, you broke both ankles. The hospital psychiatrist told you to write a list of all the good things that lay ahead of you, to think of the future instead of relentlessly probing your immediate sores. Like what, you asked. Falling in love, the doctor said with some impatience in his voice. Marriage, children. You're shitting me, right? No, those are generally the things that make women happy. The next day, you brought him a list. You'd press down so hard on the pencil it could be read with a finger. I will not fall in love. I will not marry. I will not have children. The doctor glanced at the paper and put it down on his desk. He looked out the window and neither of you spoke for the rest of the session. When you are done being happy, go to the supermarket. Push the cart past the groceries you bought there over the years. The Special K, the Jones sausage, the breaded chicken cutlets, the things your husband once ate, the things he loved. Travel the aisles like a tourist. Admire the mountains of canned goods. Adjust a box of fusilli on the bottom shelf. Feel the cool air of the freezer bins on your face. Smile at the other shoppers. Buy nothing. Want nothing. Leave the empty cart in the parking lot at such an angle that the slightest breeze will send it rolling into that black escalade hogging up three spaces. When you are done being happy, take up origami. Start with the pile of paper on your desk, the unread correspondence that grows wild and rank with each passing week. Pick a card, any card, fold it in half, then a quarter. Repeat until you have a tight little condolence cube and the only word showing is loss. Why did you try to hurt yourself? The doctor had asked some weeks after the list incident. You were at the home by then. You were never told if your parents were unwilling to take you back or not allowed. It was a relief either way. I have nothing to say about that, you said. We need to make a plan of action, he said. Things you can do if those thoughts come back. What thoughts, you asked. He looked at his hands. In the same way that oncologists never say the word cancer to the cancerous, Psychiatrists never say the word suicide to the suicidal. You understand, he said, there is no self-destruction without the destruction of others. 
I understand completely, you said. The Celts used to remove the brains of their dead kings and mix them with lime to make brain balls. They were their most powerful weapons. He had nothing to say about that. When you are done being happy, decide that life is not a list of events to be experienced, but a set of questions to be answered, and not the sort of questions you used to ask, like, is the eye really the only bloodless organ? You must ask yourself the big questions. Why are you here? What is the purpose of life? Do this while you bake the checkerboard cake. Halfway into the recipe, realize you neglected to buy the ingredients you needed at the supermarket. Instead of contemplating the meaning of life, you must now ask the universe if baking soda will work just as well as baking powder. There is no answer, and that is your answer. Just keep moving. When you are done being happy and the three sunken layers of the checkerboard cake are cooling on metal racks, Pull out the box of stationery from the bottom drawer of your desk. Break the seal. This is the marbled paper your son brought back from Florence his junior year abroad, right before everyone started to use email and stopped writing letters. Make a new list on this obsolete sheet. There is no hope of joy except in human relations. There is no hope of joy except in human relations. There is no hope of joy except in human relations. When you are done being happy, go feed the cake to the ducks at the pond. Toss the crumbs by the handful onto the surface of the water and watch the birds fly towards you from all directions. Pay attention to how they land heels first, spraying water into the air ahead of them. Notice how they keep their wings wide open to break their fall. Throw with wild abandon so that everyone gets a little. Thank you. I am so happy that you read that story. Um, you know, reading your collection, it it was, this is so cliche, but it was such a journey. Yeah. <laughs> and getting to that last story and reading it, it left me on a note that I think solidified emotionally how I felt about the whole collection. Um, and I just really loved it. So it was wonderful to hear you read it aloud. Yeah, thank you. And it, if we're going right straight into the conversation. Let's just go there. Let's go because it's such a good story to um, segue into my first question, mm -hmm. which was about hope. Right. And it's funny that you, repeat that line there is no hope well yeah. no hope but no hope and joy I don't want to I don't want to ruin right. the line paraphrase it wrong um but your book is filled with characters that are taking stock of their situations with varying degrees of hopefulness and hopelessness and I found myself kind of with each story regarding hope in a different and increasingly complex way so I guess I'm wondering how much is the fine line between hope and hopelessness a conscious decision that you're playing with or did did it rise from the stories themselves or would you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, so um, actually it's funny that um, I was uh, doing an interview for a podcast the other day and I was so surprised that the interview said, you know, he goes, wow, how did you get hope into every story? And I'm like, you're kidding me, right? Or as she would say in the story, you're shitting me, right? Um, so it's um, it was never a conscious decision. And in fact, except to the uh, point where when you're writing about climate change, it is and the climate crisis and the what's going on with the planet and the humans, you know, the, the humans future, future of all of everything. It's very hard to have hope, you know, it's very hard. And so, and it's very hard to, uh, when you're, when what you do is you write about it and you're writing about all these terrible changes going on and how they will affect and, you know, when science knows what's going to happen, if this continues, um, 
the hope is a you know what that little what that thing with feathers you know so it's like you know so it's in my stories it's often like the birds are often bringing uh, the, the sort of hope like nature delivers the hope itself um except for that last story which is like i purposely end the series in there so that um there is you know you're not left with like this gloom and doom and we can't do anything it's why people don't act because they think it is so hopeless in order to get people to act on climate change and really put the pressure on their governments they've got to have some hope Otherwise, you know, we just will dissolve, dissolve into nihilism and, you know, just pure chaos. So so every story was different in terms of, um, you know, how much hope is sometimes just barely suggested. Um, like in the very dark title story, High Wire Act mm -hmm. is very dark. And but yet the uh, the only hope comes, you know, just like, like this glimmer is that somebody had tried to resist and that's it. You know, it's like but it's it's there, you know, that that, that somebody was pushing back against it. So, um, yeah, so that's that's how it is was with, with hope. Every story was different. These this is a collection. These stories were written over a period of 15 or more years. Okay. Um, but I have, in fact, been writing about the climate easily that long, too. So no matter what the subject, it, it's always was in the back. But just, no, hope is not conscious, um, but except in trying to throw a little tiny bit of hope in after. Well, yeah, yeah uh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to, to add that it's never cheesy. I mean, hope when you if you haven't read the collection, you might think that um, as throwing little glimmers of hope as, as in something that's that's artificial or, or anything, it's not, it's never artificial. And in fact, I feel the most hopeful in your stories that are the most real, mm -hmm. you know, even the ones that are the most bleak in a sense. Uh, and I don't use that, that word um, as a criticism. Um, those were, so, this isn't a question. I, I'm just praising your ability to do that. Um, I yes. thought it was wonderful. Yeah. So, and like, and hope. Um, I I am quite familiar uh, personally with uh, mental illness in the, my family, and I also I know how very difficult it is to have hope um, when you either have a mental illness or you are in a family with mental illness. And so I wonder if you'd like to talk about you, the sense of hope that there is in your novel and your beautiful novel. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's funny that it is a book about, about mental illness in a sense. Um, my character Portia is diagnosed bipolar and I don't, I didn't try to make that, um, I guess, such a sentence, such like a death sentence. And I think really the hope comes in, um, it comes in in, in her dreams. Um, the, the chapter that I read, Hunger, um, I was trying to, um, describe really what it was like to have a manic episode. I mean, not every person who suffers from bipolar will have a mania that's like that, but um, I have experienced it um, many times in my life. And in a weird way, it those episodes were some of the most hopeful for me because it opened up the world in a way that um, that was new and surprising when the rest of my life felt very dark and mm. oppressive. So, um, so sorry, I stumbled a little bit at the beginning of this because it really the hope in the book is my own hope, right. <laughs> um, my own hope to be understood in a sense. And, and it's not that my characters are me, but that I wanted to show some beauty in um, what, a lot of people see as, as just a very problematic disorder um, or um, diagnosis, yes. if that makes sense. 
Yes, I, I had thought actually that the, and we'll talk about your, the ending later, but that the, that the especially towards the end, it gets incredibly hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, that there's a great deal of hope there all around. And um, I think you do a tremendous job. Um, I, I, frankly, from the outside mania, it looks like like this great thing, you know? If, if only we could control it, you know, and bottle it, it's like, wow, that looks like fun. Now get in the car, honey. We're going right, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's why the, the ending, you know, the waking up from that, is is kind of a physical thing you know the coming back down to earth which we all have to do whether we're manic or just right happy <laughs> I yeah i know it's great so uh since we're talking about like um the the ending let's before uh let's back up a little bit and i'd like to talk about just from so this so my book is a collection of short fiction, but in fact I've I've written novels and I'm working on a novel now and this and um a book length memoir. So actually structure, I'd just like to ask a craft question about how you integrated your use of the time in the novel. I thought was amazing the how it totally reflected the inner life of somebody with uh, a mental illness, you know, that there, uh, it's sort of one of the first things that sort of goes is like the concept of time and the brain is just like all over. And it was just this wonderful. And so how did, was how conscious and how hard was that to develop that structure that also reflected the inner workings of a ill yeah. man? Thank you for asking that. Um, it it was not very, it was not conscious so much as this is what happened when I stopped fighting myself. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I I wanted an oppor I wanted an opportunity to um, to not to 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 tell a story all at once, which sounds very ambitious. Yeah. But again, going back to this idea of the experience of of mania, or even just the experience of um, having a brain chemistry that's different, or an experience that um, filtering experience in a different way from other people. You know, mm -hmm. writing is all about taking the story um, and and pulling it like um, like yarn almost, spinning it and turning it into this linear thing that can be um, right. processed and read and understood. And, you know, I've gotten pretty disciplined with doing that from writing short stories because they have to start and then they have to end, you know, right. <laughs> or right. else nobody's gonna read them. Um, and when I started this book, um, I just, I, I struggled at first in the beginning, then I was like, heck with it. I want it to happen all at once. I just want it to reflect how I see a story, which mm -hmm. is all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and of course that can't happen, you know, um, literally. But so I just, I just allowed um, the logic to flow based right. on association and I'm glad that people could follow it because I I was afraid. Um, so now you had enough markers of time, you know, that it be it was for uh, the reader to hold on to, uh, but that the but the actual experience of reading was as you describe of it everything happening all at once, and um, and and time is often, um, you know, is it's neither here nor there when you're in episodes you know if you're just it's like <laughs> time and, time and place have no relevance to the journey as they used to yeah. say by youth so yeah so good good job there with uh with that structure for the and that material yeah I, thank you you know I also I also always wonder having written a, a short story collection myself or put together one um I always wonder how other writers structure their story collections and what you looked out for if if you um if you knew kind of instinct instinctually how the stories should unfold and, and what markers you looked 
in right. each of the stories to kind of, um, you know, base them out. Uh, I know my editor was always very concerned about putting too many angry husband stories together in my first book, you know, and so um, how was that? How was that process for you? Right. So um, I actually years ago at AWP, I went to um, uh, a, a program done by uh, Steve Almond, who I know a lot of people know, a Boston area writer, about arranging the short story collection. And so um, I listened to that and I'd taken some notes and and I, you know, over the years, I had put together collections. Um, and it was important first, actually, to, to, because uh, I had many more stories than, than these stories. So the, for the first part was just pulling out the stories that sort of had uh, the climate crisis and nature and animals of the world um, in there somewhere. So I sort of pulled them together thematically. And as far as order, I, I just sort of pulled my hair out a lot. You know, I just, I kept, I kept shuffling the cards and shuffling the cards and what's the magic order, you know, and what's the, the important first story. Um, so I, I just tried a lot of combinations. Uh, I knew I wanted that particular story at the end though. It's just so, sort of a re release. Um, but other than that, I really didn't know. And that, so then the collection was surprised and during the editing process, I kept expecting somebody to say, well, this story should go here and that story should go here. And then finally I said, well, what about the order of the stories? And they're like, well, they're fine. Why, <laughs> why do you ask? And I was like, well, I don't know, because I don't know what I'm doing, you know, and, right. <laughs> and maybe you know what you're doing. But it was um, so that's how that happened. I didn't know what I was doing and just did it and nobody stopped me and I, in the end I guess that's really the best the best advice <laughs> not wonderful when that happens <laughs> when no one stops you no one stopped me nobody said no 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 this story doesn't go here you know and uh you know I'm used to having editors totally reshape novels or something like that but, but, but no the order was fine and, and oh, what a it. gift but yeah. it was I mean your your stories are so um, imaginative and bold and I I just I don't know I felt excited to read the next one at each one so whatever you did it was some sort of magic where they weren't too similar well I don't think any of your stories are actually that similar but I'm I'm digressing um <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I have... they're very, very dissimilar. And maybe yeah. that's why the order almost didn't matter. There wasn't a cluster of angry husbands, you know, <laughs> there wasn't, right. that they, were, they were different styles, they were in different voices, they were, were very, they're very different from one another. So I guess maybe that was the secret sauce is that okay. they didn't, I didn't have to separate ones that were too similar. But and this goes right into my next question, because I did feel, obviously, um, that nature was present in yeah. each story. And I hate saying nature, because what is nature? I mean, we're in nature right now. But I mean, the force of, of um, weather, animals, climate mm -hmm. change, um, a garden. God, I loved that story. And it almost seemed like nature shows up in each of these stories as the deliverer of truth and mm -hmm. some of your characters were very um drawn to nature um like finding comfort in the objectivity of it even if it wasn't telling them a story that they wanted to hear um and I guess let me look at my notes here so I know what question I'm asking <laughs> um yeah, I guess I just I mainly just want to hear you talk about that. Do you agree? Do you agree that there is kind of a magnetism between your human characters and the natural world and what they're seeking there, even when the natural world isn't necessarily coddling them? Right. So um, the whole I mean, the climate crisis is really how we um how we survive, how we get through the world with changing nature, you know, um, that as everything changes, how do we survive? 
um, how the, um, and it's changing, you know, we are both the, uh, the, the victim and the, the perpetrator of this particular crime. Uh, the animals are just the victims of yeah. our crime. So it's like, so they are really like, I guess the, the innocence compared to us, you know, that everything is falling around, down around us. And what are we going to do? Well, you know, the animals are just still just sort of there moving forward forward in the always in the present you know and that they are always like they know what they are, are meant to do you know they're born in one of the stories infant kettering um uh less is looking at uh, a spider you know and the spider's just born knowing how to do all that and just knows what it's supposed to do and that to, and what to do to survive and in fact in that particular story I mean, animals do no more, no less and no more. And in fact, the spider web, they do a, 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 a perfect spider web the first time. And then over its lifetime, that spider web gets messier and messier. In other words, they learn how to do just enough to survive, that they don't have to do that incredibly intricate. Well, they can throw a few strands out right. here. They're right. not going to catch that moth. And so, you know, they... Um, it's it's hard, but it's harder for the animals to to adapt. And so, not only uh, do we are we suffering, we're watching we're watching their extinction. We're watching their um. So it's like we're having to do both: watch our own extinction, watch their extinction. They don't know they're going extinct. You know, they they are just going through their day. Uh, you know, yeah. just sort of trying to do what they. Are, are are born to do and yet humans with our consciousness are unable to really i mean if we were like that well we wouldn't be in the trouble we are today you know we we would just be have calmly gone through without constantly wanting more and right. and doing more and and that's not what animals do um you know there's a few who hoard food for the winter but they're just thinking about one winter they're not yeah. thinking about like 50 winters and all that so there's um yeah so the the nature animals everything is like a more or less of a constant that the uh humans come up against because they are sort of just destroying it and um they want comfort from nature um that's not really all possible anymore um you know nature's just not giving back the way it used to, we're yeah. destroying what used to give us comfort. I mean, we're destroying us. So you can all see how very grim, <laughs> grim these stories can get. But um, um, I before, yes, because I don't want to keep an eye on the time. We don't want to run out yeah. before we talk about like this really important thing in your book, which is in your title. I mean, survivals in my title. I mean, yours are like, are is the dreams you know, in the lobby of the uh, dream hotel. Um, and so it's like the dreams bleed into mental illness and and back and forth. And, um, and that there's the, you know, often an inability to distinguish between uh, reality and dreams um, within the book, which you convey so well, which is, you know, a um, an important part of the mental illness um because i used to take yes and that this is also then teo do you pronounce it teo we do here they um you know he, 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 but he goes, yeah and he's also starts doing that the the dream into the reality and so i'd like to hear your thoughts about like um the the dreaming brain and the mentally ill brain in mm -hmm. the novel are you it was that what what were you what were you what were you thinking when you were first of all I was thinking how lucky I am that no one called me out for writing about dreams because oh my god it's so hard to do and no one really wants to hear about them um but I tried to make it as seamless as I could um so yeah thank you for pointing that out I, I think you know I wrote this book I think a little bit straighter than some people are um, 
giving me credit for, meaning that they're giving me too much credit because I didn't want any of it to be tricky. You know, I didn't want people to say, oh, is Portia delusional? Oh, is this really happening? Um, is Theo really dreaming about her? Because I intended all of that to be real. You know, the reality of the book is the reality. Um, and so I, I hope that that comes through. Mm -hmm. The dreamscapes, I mean, this book for me is less about mental illness and more about escapism. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's a, it's a woman who is at a disadvantage um, to the people around her. And when she dares to hope for something that seems crazy, because she actually is crazy, um, that is used against her. And so I wanted to make the dreams beautiful because I wanted the reader to want her to dream. I wanted the reader to maybe even despite their own um, thoughts about romance or true love or whatever, I wanted them to want Portia and Theo to be together to some extent or, or for them to win in some way or another. So, so yeah, I, I tried, I wanted to make it vivid. I wanted to make, I wanted to give Portia's world a chance in the real world. Um, and I, I'm not going to give away. The as answer. does, as does her wonderful psychiatrist in the hospital. Oh my God, she was great. There's so what she's actually using daydreams, you know, get the daydreams down on paper. And, and, you know, one session she's like, well, you can't, you can't dream any bigger than that. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she can't dream any bigger than just alone with a waitress job. And, right. and she goes, well, no, that seems pretty sweet to me right now. You know? Right. Right. You know? Yeah, way. I'm so glad you pointed that out because, you know, I do, I did intend for her original psychiatrist, Dr. Shea, to be a little icky. Yeah, he, um, went, he was just a little lame. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah patriarchal. Like, yeah. 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 And, and I, I like to give that, you know, I'm glad you pointed out because I, I thought about her, her new doctor in the hospital as, as kind of being a shimmering beacon of hope, mm -hmm. you know, someone yeah. From the outside world someone um you know with a degree <laughs> uh, an authority figure who is on her who wants to be on her side yes that was just great um as i should say about all this dreaming you know but i've forgotten um i um years or two ago i took a a course about the dreaming brain and that that there's the the psychiatrist who ran this course actually had a theory which is still prominent is that you know that that all mental illnesses are a sleep disorder. You know, mm. that schizophrenia, you're you're basically that's your REM sleep going, you know, without, you know, that that its sleep cycles are off. Depression is like you should be sound asleep. And instead you are having to trudge through the day. And um, you know, and, and bipolar too, it's that that's a sleep disorder and that you can create psychosis by simply withholding sleep, which you know seems to validate that theory so it i thought that that was really fascinating i thought about that a lot in the reading of this how and how does it move from one state to another because that's what it is you know you hook up the brain to um mri and you're sound asleep but you're dreaming i mean there nothing is different in that scan i mean nothing i mean that brain shows up just as active as if you are like you know awake and writing a book or whatever right. it is that one does so yeah and I think that um I think dreams do have power and and um they do yeah that's really interesting I'm gonna have to think about that yeah think about that think yeah. also about the fact that dreams uh before mania become more mm -hmm. violent and uh they become more vivid and that they have death and injury in them before uh mania Oh, this wow. is fascinating. This is, know. This is open. <laughs> oh man, take take yeah. a course in the dreaming brain. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we should we should all take that course. Um, yeah. I'm gonna jump in. Um, if you don't mind, I, I hate to interrupt this conversation, but we have 
um, a couple of questions from the people who have attended the event. And the first question is, is uh, directed toward Joanne, but I think it applies to both of you. And it's, can you talk about what, what, what the impetus was that got you to write the story that in Joanne's case you read to us and that in Genevieve's case, the novel? And I think you've answered a little bit of that, um, but there's a, a, the 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 part of the question that goes with this is, and in what format? In what you know? Why the refrain? Why the dreams? Why this? Yeah. So that particular story, every story has a different genesis, and I do remember this. Um, some stories simply begin with a phrase, and um, so for me. For that story, I just sort of had scribbled on a piece of paper when you were done being happy. And then at some point I, I came, you know, just sat down and um, and started just playing with it. And because it was already in the second person, when you are done being happy, that that simply created that format. And um, it's sort of it's and then it just I don't know stories are just you know it's all a little magical isn't it you know I don't in the the fact that it says when you're done being happy meant that there had been happiness lost and um yeah I don't and then these things just sort of happen in a story and you 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 play with it till it's right and then the refrain, refrain was because that is the phrase that came to me so every time I was stuck in the writing of the story, I would start all over again, say, when you were done being happy, and just sort of go from there. And, um, you know, when it was written at all, as I said, these stories are written over a long period of time um, in my life. And this was, uh, I think, a point in my life when, uh, you know, my kids had all left for college or, you know, were in just a way. And so it was me at a different stage of my life. And it doesn't mean I was unhappy. I know I, that's funny, like it was, um, the fact there's like, I think two stories, if not more that talk about suicide. I've, I've not been suicidal, but in fact, it was something that just, it's like this other voice that comes to me when I write that is, that perhaps might be, would, yeah, might be, need some help. <laughs> I get that. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. And and I love um I love when lines come to you. It's like you kind of have to honor that. It's almost the same as the dreaming brain giving you something, you know. It's um that's cool. Uh I if I can answer the, the impetus question, um I think that I'm going to try to answer it in a way that I haven't, that I'm not repeating myself, but basically my life was in turmoil and I needed something to hold on to. So talk about survival. Mm -hmm. um, I needed a story that was mine um, because I was in a time of life where other people, um, not so much in the same way, but very much in the same, um, in the same energy as what happened to Portia where other people were trying to tell my story much loud, much more <laughs> loudly over me. And so the novel was was kind of my life raft. Um, so the impetus was, I, I have to write something. I have to say something. I have to give my experience in life um, a vessel. And so I'm, my God, I mean, I'm so grateful that it actually went out into the world and became something because it, it almost didn't matter um, when I was right. writing it, you know? Right. Exactly. So. Oh, that, 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 those are both really good answers. And I, and I would just want to add that, you know, when you write something uh, and when you uh, begin the journey of publication, it matters. It matters to a lot of people. And um, the two books that we're talking about this evening, they matter. Um, and so I'm, I'm uh, you know, on that on that note, um, which is somber at best, um, let's move to one, let's move to one that is a little happier. And it, and it goes like this. Which aspects or parts of uh, writing your books did you enjoy the most? Hmm. Let's start. Is this, is this to both of us? Yes. Yes. Um, um, I, I, that's hard to say with a story collection. You know, I, I could answer that when it comes to novels 
or a full length, but story collections, it was just like, you know, close to over 20 years. I think there's a story there. I, I did it. I began at Bennington in, in 1999 or 2000. So, um, so stories are actually, I'll just say that stories are something I do sort of in between novels, you know, or while I'm writing a novel, I'm trying to step back from the novel. Um, there's a couple of stories in there that are, in fact, I'm writing a novel, I need to explore a character further, I'll jump way ahead in the novel and create a short story with the characters. And there's two of those, at least in this, where I have done that. So, um, you know, so the short story writing is just sort of a, 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 a nice break and uh, an exploratory. You can just be more adventurous in a short story. You know, you can take more risks than, you know, like when you were done being happy. I mean, is that like, is that a story? I don't even know what that is, but that is like something that, you know, short enough, I couldn't go on. That couldn't even be a long, short story. You know, it was just meant to be a certain length and uh, uh, taking a lot of risks in terms of, of space and time and subject matter. So that's it. That's my answer. Yeah, I'm over here nodding so much. Just yeah. the idea of, of of using stories as this a way to be more adventurous while you're, you know, in the long haul with right. a novel. Um, I think I really enjoyed um, starting off with an idea of who my characters were um, and watching them on the page make their own decisions as mm -hmm. I as I wrote. Um, it it was it was really fun. Well. It was fun and terrifying um, because I had a deadline and I didn't know how it was going to end. Yeah. And uh. It was like, um, it was, it was, what is, what, you know, what is Portia going to do next? How is she going to react to this? And when I was really in the groove, it was like, I wasn't, it didn't feel like I was making the decisions for her. And that was cool because it, first of all, it felt less narcissistic because um, I didn't want to always base like, my characters on what I would personally do. Um, and so watching them come to life um, absolved me, <laughs> right. but also I think made the book so much better because um, it took on its own momentum. And that was really cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, those are, those are fantastic answers. Um, and so so, so as we come to the conclusion of, of this evening's conversation, and it's been a great conversation, the last question for you is, um, is um, what would you like readers to take away from your books? That's a, hmm. that's a, that's a big one. Um, yeah. But it's at the same time, you know, given that we're dealing with, you know, climate change and hope, hopelessness, uh, dreams, uh, mental health, all sorts of, you know, all, all aspects of survival. Um, what, what would you want readers to take away? Um, do you mind if I answer? No, you go. Um, I think, uh, I, I think in my book, if I'm advocating for anything, I'm advocating for um, for self-acceptance in a way. Um, I, I hope, even though Portia doesn't have a, a great time of it, I hope that some readers will recognize their thinking patterns and their imaginativeness and, and their way of viewing the world in my characters. And if they've been in a situation where people are trying to control them with um, with a more black and white logical uh, reasoning that I just, I hope it, it, it gives some people um, a needed dose of validation. Um, and that's not to say, you know, go crazy or whatever, but just, I, I want, I hope that's, certain readers see themselves in the characters that I've written and and accept that, I guess. Nice. Um, I often, but when I write about um, specifically these uh, sort of 
environmental fiction stories. Um, I use a lot of science and I, I always hope that, um, you know, that I can make the science and fiction so, sort of palatable, you know, that people can, have a, can understand what what is creating the climate crisis and the and change and uh and 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 cycles and nature that it's very hard to grasp from um reading an academic paper or reading a scientific journal you know i i believe that the the arts have uh, a big part to play in uh in in, in uh education in educating people about climate change because it's just an easier way you you learn you about the world through people and characters are people so you know you read about characters and and maybe you have a better understanding of uh you know the uh, our changing climate and our changing world so that, that's that's probably it well um I, I think that's a really good note to end on, that the arts matter, that the arts make a difference, that through the arts, that through our writing, we can bring people to an understanding of a world that may be slightly incomprehensible to them, or mysterious, or problematic, or even frightening. On that note, I want to encourage everyone to buy these books that are behind me, High Wire Act and in the lobby of the Dream Hotel. They are in my library, and I'm so happy to have them here. I'm so happy to have Joanne and Genevieve with us this evening. Thank you, both of you, for a really engrossing conversation. Um, it was very enlightening and um, a toast to all of us for survival. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, Cass. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.